get going now, Sandra. Absolutely. We shall. Thank you. Love the jazzy music. Everybody, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight or this morning, wherever you may be calling in from. Welcome to this Sydney Southeast Asia Centre webinar series on economic and social development. And Dr. Sandra Seno Alde is joining us tonight for the first in this special webinar series. My name is Natalie Pearson and I work at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. Before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and to recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently calling you from the land of the Bidjigal people and I'd also like to acknowledge that the university's campus, uh, Camperdown campus, where the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre is based, uh, is located on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and uh, further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So as I indicated, uh, we are joined by my colleague, Dr. Sandra Seno Alde from the University of Sydney's Business School, where she's the director of the program for high achieving students. I think it's pronounced DL, is that right, Sandra? It's DL. DL, DL, very good. Uh, so Sandra is going to be speaking to us about regional integration in ASEAN uh, and why the rich keep getting richer in the ASEAN global trade network. She's going to speak to us for about 30 minutes and then we'll have the op opportunity for some questions uh, from Sandra. Uh, so if you have questions arising throughout the webinar, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A function down below and we'll come to those later in the, in the webinar. But without any further ado, Sandra, I'd like to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Natalie. And uh, I'm streaming to you live. Uh, from the lands of the Gadigal, Gamigal, and Bidjigal peoples, uh, and who have, they have been uh, for 40,000 years, been learning on this land and learning from this land. And it's in the spirit of learning uh, that we gather here virtually uh, today. So today we've got, uh, this week was, a, was an interesting week for all of us uh, because we started out a very explosive week. Uh, with the release of the Pandora Papers on Monday. It's the largest investigation in journalism history, uh, exposing a financial system that benefits the world's rich and powerful. Uh, and while the Pandora Papers offer us an opportunity to view uh, why the rich or understand why the rich get richer from the perspective of legislation and regulation and this whole hidden network of uh, tax havens, that's not what we're going to do today. Rather, we're going to view the world from the perspective of our relationships and our uh, networks, our relationship networks, because we are after all uh, social people and we need to understand how we are all connected to each other and what the implications of this uh, connectedness uh, are. So today we're going to view the world from the lens of um, networks and very simply, Networks are representations of relationships between actors. And so this, this, uh, this uh, diagram that you see here on the, on the right uh, are diagrams of countries as actors. They're also called nodes. And the lines in between the countries and the lines in between the nodes are called um, edges. So all networks are relationships uh, between uh, actors and they all have some sort of function and they all have some sort of structure. So um, we're going to look at the ASEAN, examine the ASEAN global trade uh, network today, uh, viewing the different countries in the ASEAN global trade network as nodes and edges as import and export transactions or trade uh, transactions. We're also going to take a trip back in history to understand the whole purpose of why ASEAN uh, was formed and from there explore how the ASEAN uh, relationship, trade relationship network has evolved from 1990 to 2019. And finally, we ask the question, why does it all matter? Why should we care that this is how the ASEAN trade network uh, has evolved uh, over time? So in short, that's what we're going to do for the next 20 minutes or so. So let's start with function. 
the ASEAN trade, uh, ASEAN as a, as a network, uh, traces its back, traces its history uh, back uh, to the post World War II era when it was fashionable uh, to form uh, relationships, unify and unify regions, and so. Um, Economic integration has been a very popular form uh, of, uh, has been a very popular endeavor in the post-World War II period. And over time, the different forms of economic integration have emerged uh, on this uh, spectrum that you see on the screen. So you've got free trade areas where countries essentially remove uh, tariffs uh, with each, in, in trade with each other. Customs union, unions are slightly uh, different in that in addition to removing tariff barriers uh, with, in trade with each other, uh, member countries also create a customs border so that when, uh, when goods or services enter uh, the borders of any one of its countries, uh, that uh, member countries, then uh, that, that, good, th that product or that service is only taxed once. A common market equalizes, uh, tends to equalize uh, the prices of goods, uh, factors of production, because factors of production are free uh, to cross borders. So that includes um, capital, for example, or people. So when people are free to move and work uh, in, in, in the different countries that are members of a particular region, then uh, that's a common mar market. And then we've got economic unions where economic policies are aligned uh, among countries and we have total economic integration or total integration where uh, we have an alignment of not just economic policies but also social policies. Now Europe leads the way in, uh, in the formation of integrated regions. Europe to this day uh, had, remains the most deeply integrated region in the world, and it has its longest history in uh, and, and longest experience uh, in integration, starting in 1957 with the um, formation of the um, European uh, Economic um, Community. Um, ASEAN was formed much later with very with a with sl with a slightly different purpose, but there was a uh, an objective why ASEAN was formed. So the Association of Southeast Asian Nations was formed 10 years after the formation of the European Economic Community. And as the name implies, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the original intent of ASEAN wasn't to integrate. It wasn't to unify. Otherwise, it would have been called the Union of Southeast Asian Nation, Nations, ASEAN, or the Cooperation of Southeast Asian Nations, which will result in an acronym that's unpronounceable. Um, but it was formed in 1967 as essentially a friendship, a friendship group um, that, 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 that was just committed to be friends uh, with each other. It was more than uh, it was it, it was more than a decade uh, later when the ASEAN Free Trade Network, or AFTA, uh, was finally um, formed uh, in 1992. And more recently, the ASEAN Economic Network was formed in 2015. So the function of ASEAN has kind of evolved and changed uh, over time. And today we can summarize the functions of ASEAN as to foster closer economic relationships so that uh, we lower uh, the barriers to trade uh, with it, um, among the members of ASEAN. And in so doing, we lower economic risk so that also in the process, we lower political risk. So the, the spirit of ASEAN is kind of today, is kind of like the spirit of the European Union when it first started in 1957. Let's all work together. Let's form close relationships with each other so that in the effort to form friends, uh, friend, friendships within the nation, the, the probability of getting into conflict with each other kind of reduces as well. So in summary, the function of ASEAN has evolved over time uh, to one where we, we, low, we lower economic risk so that in the process, we also lower political risk. So having nutted out the functions of ASEAN, uh, what 
uh, let's take a look at the implications on the ASEAN structure. So as the ASEAN uh, function has evolved over time, how has the ASEAN structure evolved uh, over time? So to explore uh, the changing nature of the structure of ASEAN, we're going to, to use three very basic uh, network measures. We're going to look at the size of the ASEAN global network. Uh, and look at the number of countries that are inside or that have participated in the ASEAN Global Trade Network from 1990 to 2019. We're also going to look at closeness, how, 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 how deeply clustered uh, is, uh, is, uh, has, the, has, a, has a network been. So closeness in network science is measured by what's called a clustering coefficient, which is essentially a number between zero and one where one means that the, that the network is tightly and perfectly clustered. So when a network is clustered, it essentially means that all the nodes are connected to each other. And if, for example, you and I are friends, we are also friends with each other's friends. So that's what close clustering uh, means. And the third thing that we're going to explore is the, the presence of hubs. So hubs are going to be measured uh, today using a combination of the value of, the, of, that, of, a, of a country's total trade within the network and also the number of its connections. So um, before we move on, uh, I'd like to first focus on, let, let's, let's take a step back and look at hubs and focus on hubs for a moment because it's these hubs uh, that are at the, at the heart of our uh, topic today. So hubs in network science are essentially the rich nodes. They're rich because they're the most connected nodes in a network. Uh, so this, what, what you see on the screen right now is a visualization of um, a YouTube video and the network of links. Um, that this YouTube video uploaded by uh, the Young Turks in 2014 looks like. So this video, the Young Turks hub, um, is, uh, is, a hu the, is a hub in this YouTube network because it's highly, um, it's a highly connected node. And in network science, this hub is, is referred to as a rich node. And this is what we're going to explore today, how hubs are formed in the ASEAN region and, and how these hubs get, tend to get larger over time. So this is the rich get richer effect uh, in uh, networks. So there are two reasons, uh, there are two drivers that, uh, that underlie the formation of hubs and two reasons why hubs tend to get larger uh, over time. So the first reason why hubs tend to get larger over time is simply that uh, a network grows. As more nodes get added to the network, the most connected nodes tend to get even more connected over time. And this is a natural phenomenon in networks, uh, whether the networks are biology networks or trade networks, it's, it's um, network growth, sheer network growth drives increased um, connectivity. So this is an example of how a network, which first starts off as two nodes on the uh, top row at the leftmost uh, network on the top row, we start off with two nodes. And as, those, as, as this network grows over time, those two original nodes tend to become the, more, the most uh, connected uh, in the network over time. So sheer, you know, you've, the older and more established nodes tend to get um, more, even more connections uh, over time. The second, so the first driver for uh, hubs getting larger and the rich getting richer uh, over time is simply network growth. Now, the second major driver uh, that explains why hubs get larger uh, over time and the rich hubs get even richer over time is uh, something else. And for this, I'd like to 
digress just a little bit and invite all of you to participate uh, in, in a little experiment. Uh, and this is a little bit risky on my part because I don't know how this is going uh, to go. But if you're watching this live, uh, please grab your mobile phone or, um, uh, or uh, open up a browser uh, on your laptop, on your computer, or on your, on your mobile phone. Type in uh, menti.com. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the website that's up here uh, at the top of the screen. Go to menti.com and type in the code 50791882. And answer this question: If we could, if you could go on a holiday, you know, a fully uh, paid uh, holiday, and uh, and you know, and be free, pandemic free, and, and completely, you know, un, uh, be be safe uh, from uh, from viruses and whatnot, uh, where would you go? And I think uh, you can nominate up to two. Um, uh, up to two uh, locations. Awesome. This is great, everyone. Thank you. Keep it coming. Uh, and I'm going to um, stop the voting in a few um, minutes. Awesome. All right. So would you go to Bali, Laukala, Matterhorn, or Paris? No cheating. Don't go to the, don't go to the internet and Google where these places are. Okay, great. So you've got the top on the list is Paris. Uh, second on the list is Bali and Laukala and Matterhorn. Okay, great. What have we just illustrated? Let's see what we've just illustrated. So um, I took these countries from the list of the uh, top 50 uh, Forbes uh, travel bucket list of 2019 um, destinations. And the first one on the list was Bali. Congratulations, Indonesia. Uh, number seven was Paris. Number 37 was Laukala, which is in Fiji. And number 50 was Matterhorn, which is in uh, Sweden, I think. So what have we just illustrated? At the top of our list was Paris, and the second one was Bali. We have just and and very few uh, voted for Laukala and Matterhorn. Why? What explains that? That can potentially be explained simply by bias. We've picked those countries because they're familiar to us. We know them. We know where Paris is. We know where Bali is. Uh, we're, we're not quite sure where Laukala is and where Matterhorn uh, is. So bias explains or is the second driver for network growth. In fact, the top 50 uh, travel bucket list of Forbes, which was uh, conducted through a survey, asked uh, participants or respondents why they picked those places. And the study found that uh, participants were, were more likely uh, to nominate a particular uh, destination as part of their bucket list if they'd seen it on social media, if they saw, if they saw it on their Instagram or Facebook, et cetera, if it was promoted on Instagram or Facebook. So, Bias is a very strong driver for the formation of hubs. It's really just a natural human tendency to gravitate towards the familiar, to gravitate to, to, to what we know. So this, the, these two uh, reasons, uh, network growth and bias, explain uh, why and how hubs tend to form in networks. And they explain why the rich tend to get richer in networks and why hubs tend to get even larger over time. So let us go back uh, to the ASEAN network structure and take a journey through time, exploring how the network has changed from 1990 to 2019 in terms of size, in terms of clustering, and in terms of hubs. Are we ready? So in 1990, this is how the ASEAN trade network looked like. We had 186 countries in the network. 
the closeness or the clustering score was at 0.87, which is pretty close to one. Let's recall that one is the highest possible score for closeness, where one means that every single node is connected to every other node. And so that everyone's friends are, are, are also friends with each other. The uh, dominant hubs in 1990, I've colored in yellow. Uh, these were China, the US, South Korea, and Japan. By the way, the ASEAN countries are colored red on this network. So this is how the network looked like in 1990. How did it look like 10 years later in the year 2000? So 10 years later, this is how the, how the network looked like. It was larger. So from, uh, from 180 countries or so, it grew to 228 countries. And it also became much closer. The closeness score is now much closer to one, uh, point at 94. But we see that the hubs are essentially the same. We've got China, Korea, Japan, and the US that have remained as dominant hubs in the network. So the exact same hubs that were dominant in 1990 were the same hubs that were dominant in, two, in uh, 10 years later in the year 2000. Um, 2010, 10 years later, further 10 years later, how did the network look like? The network was even larger with 231 countries, um, slightly closer network uh, with a score of 0.95, but with exactly the same hubs, China, the US, South Korea, and Japan. And the most recent network I visualized for you today was the network in 2019. We now have 239 countries, even larger. Closeness is roughly the same, 0 0.94, 0 0.95, but the hubs have remained exactly the same. China, South Korea, the US, and Japan. The hubs are the same, and the hubs have in fact become even larger over time when we take into consideration the trade value associated with each of these nodes and the number of connections that each of these large hubs have in the network. So in summary, what have we got? We've got the rich get richer effect in the ASEAN network. The ASEAN network has grown over time. It's become closer and more tightly coupled with the same external hubs that have grown even larger over time. I mention external because none of the hubs that have emerged in the network are members of ASEAN. China, the US, Japan, and South Korea aren't members of ASEAN, despite the fact that the original function or the original purpose of the ASEAN network was to foster trade and closer economic relationships among its 10 members. So the internally focused uh, growth that was predicted uh, to come out of integrated regions did not actually happen in ASEAN. So this internally focused growth was predicted by scholars of European integration. So what we're basically saying is that uh, the predictions of, uh, you know, the, the impacts of integration that have been observed in Europe did not quite uh, um, exhibit uh, themselves uh, in the ASEAN network. The growth in ASEAN has not been internal the growth in ASEAN has been very external and focused on four major external hubs. So the question now is, why should we care? Why should we care about this very externally focused network structure that's, that's, that's focused on four major hubs? This brings me to the second major explosive event that we all experienced this week. It was a crash of Facebook. So when Facebook crashed 
for six hours on Tuesday. Um, this caused the, uh, you know, significant disruption in government offices. It, it caused significant disruption, uh, of course, to everyone's social uh, media. Uh, but more important, it really caused disruption to companies and businesses and organizations that, that, that are dependent on WhatsApp uh, for uh, communication. So when a, a, and Facebook is an example of a large hub in the internet, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the worldwide uh, web. And when a large hub like Facebook crashes uh, as it did uh, last Tuesday, uh, the effects can be very, very disruptive. So within the context of the, Asia, uh, of the ASEAN trade network, why does it matter that the network has become larger uh, over time and has been dominated by nodes that are external uh, to the network. Well, the first clear implication is that ASEAN is now, we, we can see very vulnerable to these hubs. For any um, fluctuation that may happen uh, in China, the US, South Korea, or Japan, that uh, those fluctuations and that volatility are going to cascade uh, throughout the rest uh, of the ASEAN network. And because the ASEAN network has become much more tightly coupled and, and much more closer, closer, closer and more tightly coupled over time, the, the region is now more exposed to a rapid and widespread crisis contagion. I don't really need to explain this uh, much because we are in the middle of a pandemic where closeness matters a lot uh, in terms of driving uh, the speed and the, and the scope uh, of contagion. So ASEAN uh, is now more vulnerable to hubs uh, and is exposed to rapid and widespread crisis contagion across the region. So the current uh, uh, structure of the ASEAN region brings us back to the uh, original function of why ASEAN was formed in the first place. So ASEAN was formed in the first place to lower risk. It was meant to lower economic risk, to lower economic volatility across the region so that uh, eventually uh, it, it could uh, extend to lower political risk over time. But now, decades after the formation of ASEAN in 1967, we now begin to question whether the current structure of ASEAN can still support its original function. Maybe not, because as a risk management mechanism, it certainly looks like what the ASEAN network has done was to increase economic uh, risk rather than decrease um, economic uh, risk. And this is something that, uh, that the, the region has to contend with, how to manage uh, this increased, paradoxically increased risk exposure over time. Uh, and this, before we go, and I'm mindful of time, before, before I close uh, this, uh, this talk, I'd like to explore uh, the rich get richer phenomenon across all levels in ASEAN. Doesn't really just, it, it doesn't really just occur in trade. Um, it also occurs in businesses. So hubs in businesses uh, and hubs uh, among individual relationships. So let's take an example from um, corporate uh, boards. So I'm using old data. But the rich get richer effect or the presence of hubs in corporate boards is actually quite, uh, quite clear um, as well. So we've got uh, top boards in the Philippines. So this is uh, the top 100 corporations in the Philippines in 2015. And the blue uh, circles are the top 100 companies and the red circles are directors. So if we analyze uh, the number of boards on which independent directors sit, uh, we find a really interesting phenomenon. So when, so I, I, and, I, and I hasten to say that these are independent directors because if, 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 a, if a company is family owned or predominantly family owned, then um, 
the, the, the director uh, typically comes from that family. So these are, um, uh, the question here is who is, the, who is the, who are the most highly connected independent directors? And in 2015 uh, in the Philippines, there was this one independent director that essentially sat on 11 of the top 100 boards in the country, which means that this one single person actually had a uh, had had some degree of influence over how more how eleven percent of the top one hundred uh, corporations are run. So this person can be considered a hub, um, uh, holding together eleven uh, different companies. The same uh, phenomenon we find in Singapore. So in Singapore, we have the most connected independent uh, director uh, sitting on four of the top 100 boards in Singapore. That person is the, the biggest hub in the network of um, directors. So in closing, um, the rich get richer effect is, uh, is clear uh, in, the, in the ASEAN trade network and it has evolved over time. We have four of the same hubs have remained the same and they've become larger uh, over time. And this phenomenon is consistent uh, even at the level of business networks as well as individual networks. And that can be explained simply by two things, network growth, as networks grow, hubs tend to grow as well. And the second explanation is bias. Uh, we all tend to make decisions uh, and gravitate towards the familiar. On that note, I shall close and over to you, um, Natalie. Thank you, Sandra, that was fantastic. Um, really appreciated uh, your clear communication and um, you know communicating these concepts to us. So it was really interesting and I also love the interactive uh, component as well. Um, great to see such engagement from our, from our audience. Thank you. And everybody. I must say thank you to everyone for participating. Uh, it's it's uh, it uh, these the live experiments always um, <laughs> well it's it's un it's always uncertain as to how much people engage but thank you for being such an engaged audience today. I can imagine there's nothing worse than trying to run a Mentimeter and not getting any responses. <laughs> so it was great to see everybody answering that. Thank you. Um, I have to, um, I think you made your point really well with the Mentimeter, um, but um, I have to just, you know, pop in there and acknowledge that this is the Southeast Asia crowd. Um, this is true. Which, which might be why Bali featured so highly um, with everybody interested in visiting Indonesia as soon as they can. Um, so anyway, we do have some questions coming through. Um, I just wanted to first, well, there's a couple of questions I suppose I had as well. I just wanted to pick up on um, one of your last points, which was looking at um, this incredibly well-connected director on those boards in the Philippines. Um, you know, and it really strikes me how on earth somebody could possibly do their job properly being on that many boards and, and doing the, um, you know, reading the papers that's required of a board director. Um, but I, I was just wondering, do you know if that person is a man or a woman? That's a really good uh, question, Natalie. Uh, I don't have the, 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 the people are de-identified, but the genders are not. And this one is a man. Okay. Yeah, I think it's interesting to um, keep in mind those boys clubs when it comes to um, directors and boards, because it's also an issue we have we have here in Australia. Um, Absolutely. And before we leave that topic, uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, individual directors being um, go to people uh, for uh, for independent board seats is predominant among women directors as well. And studies have shown this, that um, sometimes it's the same woman that's appointed to yeah. uh, several boards in, in, in a country, uh, which in fact has the opposite effect of increasing gender equality on boards. It actually decreases gender equality on boards because it's the same woman yeah. uh, that tends to get picked uh, to sit uh, as, an, as a director on boards. So, yeah. and, and other women um, are not getting those opportunities to contribute and develop and um, get their names known. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, right, um, so some, some, one of my questions before I um, turn to the ones from the audience. Um, I wanted to ask you about the presence of these external actors and um, this externally rather than internally focused network structure um, and whether it indicates that the ASEAN integrated model has failed. But I, I sort of feel like you've answered that. So I thought I might ask you um, whether these external actors provide a mitigating effect to the vulnerabilities that you've outlined. Do you think ASEAN would be more vulnerable um, were it not for the um, integration of these external actors? Um, the, the, the presence of these external actors are, are it, I guess it's, it's always a double-edged um, sword uh, because the presence of these large economic players in ASEAN is, uh, is good. In, in, in one sense, because they tend to uh, spur and, and grow uh, business uh, in the region. And, and, and as you, as you um, mentioned, they, they, they kind of motivate and, and, and grow business in the region. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they become, the, the, the effect becomes negative uh, when first, the dependence on these hubs becomes, um, when these hubs become too dominant, uh, when, and when these hubs become too dominant, then that means that the, that the region is, is heavily dependent uh, on the continued um, activity of these large players in the region. So it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I will come to the audience questions now. And there's a couple about the ASEAN economic community, which I'll, I'll go to first. How would you characterize the economic risks if the ASEAN Economic Community or AEC or ASEAN was not as integrated compared to how it is now? That's a really great question. So the, I, I'd like to start off by saying that the function of ASEAN, as, as I mentioned in, in, in the talk, really changed over time from being just a, um, a friendship group in 1967, it has evolved into becoming uh, a more integrated uh, community, uh, more integrated region in 2015. So, uh, so, so this means that we're kind of, uh, the, the region is kind of late into the integration um, game. Uh, so Europe is of course way ahead uh, in the integration game and, and I've got a different, a uh, study that juxtaposes the ASEAN network and the European Union network, and the bo both networks are dramatically different from each other. Whereas ASEAN is much more loosely connected, uh, Europe is, is much more tightly um, connected and very, very internally um, uh, focused. So the nature of risk uh, doesn't remain the same uh, over time. And as ASEAN, as the ASEAN region be more deeply integrates through the ASEAN uh, economic community, the nature of risk is going to be um, different. Is going to change as well. So rather than being exposed to large hubs outside ASEAN, uh, the, the the region is now going to uh, look look inward. And with the emergence of larger hubs within ASEAN, then we will find some um, we will find some vulnerability uh, to internal hubs as well. And for those of you who are interested, the the largest hubs in ASEAN. Oh, I should well, I don't have my poll anymore, but uh, but the largest hub in ASEAN is actually quite surprising, uh, Malaysia is uh, one of the largest and most connected hubs along with Thailand. Um, everyone thinks it's Singapore, it's, it's not, it's Malaysia. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I would have chosen Singapore actually, but I am surprised that it's Malaysia. I wish we had done a little poll of that. Can you um, explain why, why Malaysia and Thailand are leading the pack? It's really the connectedness. It's, it's, it, both countries are very externally oriented and they've managed to, uh, to cultivate a very uh, a, a wide range of connections um, everywhere. That's what the data shows. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, uh, Sandra. Um, the next question is also about the ASEAN economic com community. Does the AEC entail freedom of movement of labor and capital within ASEAN? 
Yes, it it does. Uh, uh, but the I, I, I guess it's because of the history of ASEAN being so non-interventionist. Uh, the ASEAN economic community does allow for free movement of people as well as capital uh, across the region, but uh, it's limited to a very specific set of industries. So not everyone can move around. It really depends on what you do, what your profession is, and what industries uh, you're, you're, uh, you're involved in. So it's, it's, uh, it's a limited movement for now. So are those industries, I don't know if you can tell us what those industries are, are they in tech? Are they in um, foreign workers? A lot of it is in tech. Right. Yeah. Okay. What about finance? I don't have that data right now, but okay. I can certainly Sorry. get back to you in that. <laughs> Question <Okay>. without notice. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you've just mentioned history there, which is a nice segue um, to our next question from the audience, um, which is about the context within which ASEAN um, was formed. Um, the Cold War and it's, um, well, they're called CETO, um, which is, oh gosh, I, I, can't, I can't remember what the CETO acronym is, but it involved America um, in Southeast Asia and it was a military alignment and um, they've characterised CETO as the, the predecessor to ASEAN. Um, so the question is, did US capital and its dominance in Southeast Asia play a far more important role in inequalities within ASEAN compared with the EU's internal driving force? That's a really interesting um, question, um, but the, the, the US has had a significant presence in the region in history. I, I don't have the uh, absolute data to support, but, what, what, but, but I, I, I would surmise though, that both political as well as economic presence, the, the political and economic presence of the US in the region would have certainly uh, played a big role in, um, in its formation as a hub. Um, so uh, it, it was present in, in the Philippines uh, for, for quite some time. Um, it was uh, it was of course politically present uh, in the and militarily present in the region uh, with the Vietnam uh, U.S. Uh, conflict um, at war. So um, so certainly yes, uh, historically there would have been significant political as well as economic influence. Thank you, Sandra. Um, that's a good question, a hard one as well. Um, the connected hubs you mentioned in your answer earlier, would these, could you characterize these as the bamboo network, i.e. Chinese background business people who were born in ASEAN countries, such as Malaysia and Thailand? Possibly. Um, the Chinese diaspora is certainly a, a plays a big role uh, in, uh, in the region. I would have to do more further research uh, to, to understand the drivers, uh, the social uh, drivers uh, of, of, of these hubs, but certainly, yes, possibly. Yes. Well, um, it, that's connected to our next question, which is from Bin Trin. Thank you. Um, the question is, do you think ethnic ethnicities have any influence on the size and connectedness of hubs? Do you look at this factor on trade networks in your research? And do you have plans to? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, I haven't factored this in uh, my research so far, but every time I, I make these presentations, I always get more questions uh, and, <laughs> and more encouragement to look at the other factors that, that may be driving uh, network formation. But, but I, I think this is a great um, angle. Uh, culture, migration, uh, ethnicity, I think these are great uh, factors to uh, to consider in, in network growth for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, might look at that then as a next project. Yeah, okay, thank you, um, Sandra. Sounds like you've got plenty to go on yeah. with this work. It, every time I talk to you, it seems to be growing. Um, you know, last time we spoke for the SEAC Stories podcast, you talked to me a lot about um, the role of gender in, in this research as well, which is um, might play into that um, further sort of social socio-cultural research that you're talking about. Um, we don't have any more questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, now is your um, moment to pop it in the Q&A and um, get to ask Sandra um, about her work in ASEAN. Um, but while we're waiting for any further questions, 
Um, Sandra, I might just ask you, do you think the ASEAN economic integration model has failed? What are the alternatives here? Not at all. Uh, I don't think it has failed. Uh, it's, it's just grown slower. Uh, than, uh, than, than, than expected. And I think that's mainly because everyone holds up the European Union um, a, a, as an example of integration and as a, as, as a model of, as a model of you know, excellent um, integration. But really the European Union is the only one of its kind uh, in the world. Uh, no other integrated region comes remotely close uh, to the European Union. Uh, and because each integrated region is, is so different in that uh, we've got different countries that comprise the membership, different economic factors, different cultural factors, it, it's, it, it, it is to be expected that integrated regions around the world are going to grow and evolve at their own pace and at their own trajectory. Uh, it's, it's such a big research area. No one really understands uh, half uh, of what happens when an, an, a region decides to integrate. Mm -mm. Certainly not a failure. Yeah, okay, that, that's good to know. Do you think that it's at sort of ASEAN's detriment to be looking at other models when we're thinking about ASEAN? Or should we just be looking at the ASEAN model on its own terms? I think the ASEAN, I think the ASEAN region has consistently been looking, uh, has been consistently uh, dancing to the beat of its own drum uh, from the very beginning. Uh, it was. It, it's been. It's been very non-interventionist. It's been. It's been quite relaxed, actually. Uh, and mm -hmm. and a, a lot of scholars out there almost deride it as the ASEAN way, being you yes. know slow and and non-interventionist. But but if that's uh, but but that's not necessarily bad. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's it's just it's it's just its own pace. Uh, yeah. Which is fine. Um. Thank you for being so generous with answering all of these questions. We have one more from the audience, which ties into a question I had as well, actually. The question is, where does Australia fit in? Um, are we really small fry? And then my addition to that question is, where does um, Timor-Leste fit in? Because it's not formally part of ASEAN. It has, it has ASEAN aspirations. Um, do you consider Timor-Leste as part of ASEAN, ASEAN in your research? And, and also, where does Australia fit in? So thank you. This is great, great, great. These are great questions. So um, Australia is, um, I'm just looking through my notes. <laughs> Australia is certainly not a uh, small fry. It's, uh, it's one of the two, four, six, eight, it's one of the top 10, 15 uh, network partners uh, of ASEAN. So it's, it's kind of just missed, missed the cutoff of the top 10. Uh, but but we are but, but Australia is uh, in fact um, uh, one of the top uh, trading partners of ASEAN. Timor Leste is an interesting case because it's um, it's tiny, uh, and within the ASEAN uh, network, it does uh, appear, of course, uh, on the network because uh, because there there are trade relationships that occur uh, with uh, Timor Leste. Uh, it is a small player, and it's on the periphery. Of the network, it's still not uh, in the in the in the in the in the clustered core. It's still very much in the periphery of the network. And that's like that feeds into what you were saying earlier about those hubs that are older and have been there longer, sort of attracting more and reaping more benefits just simply by virtue of being um, part of the network from you know the very beginning. It's age, Natalie. It's age. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm seeing lots of parallel, parallels with social relationships as yes, well. Indeed. <laughs> well, um, we don't have any more questions, Sandra, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Really enjoyed your presentation, always do, but particularly so tonight. Thank you so much um, for sharing your research with us. We really look forward to seeing where it goes with um, all the work you're yet to do on it. But um, <laughs> thank you for sharing what you have done tonight. It's just um, really wonderful. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, everyone. You've been really great and really engaged. Thank you. Yes, it was wonderful. And if you would like to join us for the second in our webinar series uh, on economic and social development, I can promise another fabulous speaker next week, um, uh, Professor Tiho Ansev, uh, who's going to be talking about strategic planning in agriculture, 
insights from Southeast Asian experiences. So another wonderful webinar to look forward to. But for now, uh, Sandra, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you again.